I am delighted to welcome you all this morning to our panel discussion on digital borders and techno technological sovereignty. Uh, we have a good, a good group in the room this morning for 9 a.m. on a uh, on a Friday, and a great uh, a great group of panelists. We're actually also live streaming, and on Twitter at. Hashtag tech borders, is that right? Okay, there we go. Um, and I should say, you know, throwing out a word like technological sovereignty uh, in a crowd of political scientists or uh, cyber wonks is definitely red meat, but it's also a topic that has gotten a lot of attention among regular folk and uh, around the world, I should say, maybe even more so than in the United States. And so we're delighted to welcome you here today uh, for this all-star panel. And I should just say, for the, for the better part of 20 years, I think, we've been uh, debating the contours of the role of the sovereign state in cyberspace. It's uh, undeniable, on the one hand, that this network of networks that we call the internet has been a major force for the free flow of information around the world, the dissemination of knowledge, the uh, the growth of economic opportunity for people all over the globe. On the other hand, it is also very clear that when citizens participate in a global network, the ability of the nation state to uh, uh, shape their experience to protect them is, in some ways, is, uh, is much more limited. And that's both a, a feature and a bug, uh, as the technologists like to say, right? Um, and in some ways, this whole debate has, you know, unfolded in sometimes arcane corners of the uh, political science and cyberspace uh, world. It comes up in very critical uh, conversations about the future of internet governance, about the role of new or uh, existing international bodies like the ICANN or the ITU. Um, but it has been, I would say, even though it's important, probably a more obscure debate uh, until very recently. And something has changed in the last year uh, about this debate. It's taken on a new prominence. And we are seeing in the wake of the revelation, the Snowden disclosures and revelations about uh, intelligence activities around the world, a marked uptick in interest in this question of technical sovereignty. We're seeing around the world, from Brazil to Berlin, new proposals for nation states to assert their technical sovereignty. Uh, some of the proposals include things like uh, changing the locations of uh, undersea uh, transmission cables, creating new capabilities for users to do end-to-end -end -to -end -to -end encryption, norms around how governments will do uh, spying in cyberspace. Uh, some of the proposals that we're seeing may be relatively innocuous. Some of them are going to have very real uh, political and economic implications. And some of them may, as a technologist say, break things, right? Some of them may actually change some of our fundamental assumptions about how data flows and about the openness uh, and free flow of information of the network that we call the internet. So the stakes actually are quite high now. And to help us sort through all of these proposals and their implications, we do have a terrific panel today. Uh, I should say that this, uh, this event is part of a two-year project uh, jointly that we're doing with the Global Public Policy Institute entitled Transatlantic Dialogues on Security and Freedom in the Digital Age. Uh, it was launched at the beginning of the year, and it's funded by the EU delegation uh, to the United States, which we're very grateful for their support. Uh, the topic of this event is also going to be the focus of a paper, a first paper coming out of the joint project that's going to be published in early October. And it's going to analyze uh, uh, these European proposals, maybe some of the broader proposals, uh, and offer an impact assessment. Uh, and we'll be discussing some of that today. So a little bit of a preview. I should say thank you to, particularly to all of you for being here, but especially to our guests who are coming from overseas. We are uh, delighted and grateful to host you here today. Um, to introduce our panel, has been, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our partner in crime here, uh, uh, Thorsten Benner, who is the 
director of the Global Public Policy Institute based in Berlin. He is um, also the founder of GPPI, and he will be here uh, to, to kick off and to introduce our, uh, our lineup today. So please join me in welcoming Thorsten, and thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you uh, to New, New America and the Open Technology Institute for having us, for doing the project uh, together. It's indeed a terrific panel, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the panel. From Brazil to Berlin is a good motto also for, for the panel uh, itself. Uh, to my left is Carolina Rossini. She's uh, Vice President for International Policy at Public Knowledge, uh, one of the leading voices in the global debate on internet uh, policy. She's Brazilian and uh, very much follows the dis discussion in Brazil and uh, will enlighten us with this perspective. Uh, she has previously worked, among other things, uh, as a project director here with the Op Open Technology Institute at uh, New America. From Brazil to Berlin brings me to Ansgar Baums. Uh, he's uh, Director of Corporate Affairs at uh, Hewlett Packard in Berlin, has a very varied uh, career, starting out as an intelligence officer in, in Germany, then changing, among other things, to be the head of government relations at SAP, a leading German globally oriented internet company, and now with an American company and uh, feeling the heat a little bit in Berlin of the fallout of the Snowden discussions. And he's, I should also say, one of the leading voices. Uh, he's not just a corporate lobbyist, but he is also one of the leading voices in Berlin, working uh, together, among others, with Ben Scott, uh, who is also well known here at, at OTI on smartening up on digital policy issues uh, in Berlin. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Joe Nye, a towering figure in the study of international relations and also diplomatic practice uh, over the past, past uh, four decades. Uh, he's a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard. He has always been very interested in the study of power, and I think the study of power has also brought you to cyberspace uh, and uh, has, has led you to publish a number of uh, articles on what the diffusion of power means in cyberspace. And uh, you're currently also a commissioner in the Global Commission on, Glo you know, Global Commission on Internet Governance uh, and uh, are very interested in, in questions of fragmentation and balkanization and uh, very happy and proud to have you here on, on this panel. And uh, our guide through this morning is uh, Tim Mora. He is a fellow here at uh, OTI at New America, that works on uh, cybersecurity issues uh, and norm evolution. He also works on global internet politics and in particular recently on the role of swing states uh, in this debate, which I think also reflects on the discussion we're having this morning because sometimes we don't quite, don't, don't quite know where Brazil and Germany are fitting in, in, in this uh, in in this debate, uh, and Tim is also the natural bridge in the project. He's also a non-resident fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute. We're very proud to say that he began his think tank career at GPPI as a research assistant, uh, and uh, also very much promise it, uh, profited from Professor Nye at the Kennedy School, uh, where Professor Nye supervised one of uh, Tim's research papers on WikiLeaks, which was one, one of his first forays into digital issues. So with no further ado, Tim, please, over to you. Thank you, Torsten, and uh, thank you, Alan. Welcome, everybody, uh, here on Friday morning, and also everybody who's uh, joined us with the, through the live stream. Um, you can uh, please c participate in this debate uh, before the Q&A already uh, through uh, Twitter. And um, before uh, we get started, I wanted to briefly talk a little bit more about um, this first paper that we've been working on with uh, the Global Public Policy Institute. And we spent uh, yesterday um, brainstorming um, this topic a little bit. And the reason why we're here today is because over the course of the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've seen this rise uh, in terms of the political traction that some of these proposals um, have gotten. And the term technological sovereignty that you saw in the invent, uh, invitation um, is not an invention um, of ours, and um, we are not going to define the term. Uh, the reason we picked it is because it's actually a term that is used in Germany quite a lot and is actually also mentioned in the coalition agreement of the German government, where uh, the government explicitly states that 
one of its goals is uh, to enhance technological sovereignty and to regain technological uh, sovereignty in Germany. Um, so the, the goal of the paper was to, legal, to dig a little deeper and find out what does that exactly mean and what kind of proposals have we seen um, being uh, advanced by both politicians but also general thought leaders, uh, not just in Germany but Europe more broadly. And many of you um, are aware that data localization was uh, at the center of attention for um, several months at the end of last year. Um, and when we started looking into this specifically in Europe, we realized that there were a lot, actually a lot more different proposals than just focusing on data localization. And Alan already mentioned some in terms of undersea cables, calls for stronger encryption. And what we are trying to do with the paper is to provide a fuller um, overview of what these uh, proposals have been about. As you know, s many of them aren't new. Um, they've been floating around for quite a while, but they gained significant political traction over the last year. Um, and then in a second step, uh, we want to provide um, an impact assessment of do they actually achieve the goals that the people who have been uh, uh, advancing them in terms of uh, securing data, is that actually achieved through that specific proposal? And then in addition to that, looking at the secondary implications for other internet policy making principles um, that we've been looking at. Uh, so stay tuned on that. We'll, we'll keep you informed. Um, and that will, uh, we'll have more of that uh, coming out in October. Today, uh, we want to broaden the perspective a little bit and not just focus uh, on the European and the US context, um, which is why I'm particularly happy that Carolina is joining us uh, this morning. Um, and um, the way we'll uh, structure this uh, event today is we'll spend um, about the next 40 minutes uh, with a panel uh, conversation, and then we'll open up for Q&A uh, to give you a chance to participate as, as well. And we'll start out with um, the debate in Brazil last year where as part of the debate about Marco Civil, the Net Mundial conference earlier this year, which was this big internet governance summit, one of the proposals was um, centered on data localization. And there was a very intense debate in Brazil about this proposal. Um, so Carolina, it'd be very good to hear your perspective on from the beginning, where did this proposal come from, the debate in Brazil, and why it ultimately did not end up being part of the law. Sure. Um, so good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for the invitation, team. It's always an honor and pleasure to be back here. Um, and I do see this as, I always say to folks when they ask me what happened in Brazil suddenly, and I do see this six months period where everything changed in Brazil, right? If you uh, have followed at all what happened in Brazil, we have been discussing Marco Civil since 2007 when the first draft came, and actually came from the law school I was working at at the moment, at the time. And um, since its very early inception, privacy was in the core of Marco Civil. Uh, as it was freedom of expression and neutrality. Uh, but focusing on the data issue, at the same time that Marco Civil came into discussion, another issue also came into discussion, which was the uh, protection of personal data through another bill that was uh, uh, running uh, in parallel to Marco Civil. So I like to say that in Brazil, uh, we have actually three main legislations that would regulate the internet moving forward. Marco Civil, which everybody has heard, and I consider the umbrella for all of those, the Data Protection Bill, and the Copyright Reform, which is actually running for even more time. But that's not the focus of us today. Um, in 2000, uh, last year, in 2013, the revelations uh, uh, really shocked uh, Brazil and uh, helped awaken the very high levels of our executive and also the legislative. Uh, Marco Civil was going on at that time for almost six years. Uh, there was a huge traction within civil society and also the lower levels of the legislative uh, and some of the ministries, even more with the Ministry of Culture being Gilberto Gil at the time, really pushing forward uh, uh, to that bill and to really uh, recognize internet as a central piece of society, but also the de economic development in Brazil. Uh, however, it was really hard to really knock and open doors at the higher levels of the, our executive because that was not part of the agenda. At the agenda, Dilma at the time was environment reform, children's protection reform, and other reforms. And I think that when Dilma realized that even her personal email was being surveilled, and the surveillance was not just political, but it was also economic uh, uh, on Petrobras and Vale, which are our big uh, 
mineral uh, companies in Brazil, uh, she really got engaged and tried to understand. But has every first wave of reaction uh, is the first wave of reaction was a very emotional wave saying we have to protect data of our citizens without exactly understanding uh, uh, how technology works at the time. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, if you're following uh, internet governance worldwide, we were having also in Brazil a discussion if uh, uh, a variety of sectors should be involved or just states should be involved on regulating the internet, right? And her reaction was emotional and was also based on a reaction of what states need to do as uh, sovereign states. Uh, and then the proposal uh, was inserted in the bill just based in a conversation among governments and within uh, Dilma, uh, high-level government uh, uh, affiliates. Uh, and they, uh, they, introdu uh, they introduced uh, 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 a new article in the bill that was not there before regarding data localization, saying that uh, if you deal with Brazilians, even if you are not in the country, you actually would have to have servers in Brazil uh, and you would have to separate the data of Brazilians and the transactions done by Brazilians from every other uh, transaction. Uh, that was something that we never uh, have seen before in Brazil and got very strong reactions of all the stakeholders that actually depend on internet for a series of things, right? It got strong reactions from the companies, even Brazilian companies, and got a strong reaction from civil society. Uh, a lot of people actually mistakenly say, oh, Brazilians wanted that, and that's not true. So civil society did oppose that strongly and tried to reach out to Dilma through our uh, Internet Steering Committee, the CGI, and also companies reach out to Dilma saying, this is going to represent a high transaction cost for us because we need our servers in Miami because it's much cheaper, right? So uh, the companies uh, were actually very compelling. I have that data. They did a lot of presentations on data on how much would increase their cost and would make their services uh, 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 prohibitive in terms of prices and also in terms of competition with foreign companies uh, that were doing that, which of course, if they had to deal with that, which would be a high transaction cost for them to, they would still do it because Brazil represents a big market for them, which uh, would be, but that uh, uh, ask would be impeditive for smaller companies and small ISPs. Brazil has like almost 3,000 small ISPs providing local internet, so that would represent them a really big uh, 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 challenge to uh, have that installation going. So that was the data localization. I think that when Dilma realized with consultations with CGI and also Fadi went down to Brazil and that was within their agenda uh, for their conversations, Fadi Shahadi, the president of ICANN, I mean, uh, uh, she realized that that was not the case, right? Data circulates around the world, data circulates around backbone cables, so would not, localizing the data in Brazil would not solve the problem of surveillance. And of course, Brazilians were really concerned uh, on the civil society point of view that that would be a, a threat to privacy and freedom of expression. We do have INSA, of course, it's much less resourced than the American NSA. It's, ca it's called ABIN. And we have discovered more and more that ABIN does do surveillance in Brazilian citizens, including human rights movement, uh, 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 the gay movement, and all the uh, social movements in Brazil that are pretty strong, the environmental movement, the access to medicine movement. So that was discovered soon. And it's not just tracking Facebook activities, actually more than that. So of course, that also uh, uh, meant a threat to civil society and human rights movement in Brazil, and we all said no uh, to that. So I think Dilma, when she understood that that would not solve the problem, that was taken out of the bill. Um, as we understand, uh, the data protection bill is coming out of the oven finally at the end of this year, and companies are already very worried because of transaction costs. It will not ask data localization. The bill was intended to just be uh, a protection to uh, personal data in consumer relations, but then now the bill was expanded. Um, 
so this is this is not really published yet, right? But we, in the conversation of the governments, that was what they tell us. The bill was expanded to include also uh, privacy protection ag against government interference with citizen activities, which is it's a good thing. Even more, if Bar uh, Marcos View put privacy has the core of its content. Um, so we are really looking forward for the bill coming out of this at uh, the end of the year. Um, we do now not ask a data localization, but one thing that's really developing is informed consent. So informed consent, um, if you know, it's very common in the health side. So when you go to a clinical trial or something like that, you have to sign lots of papers. It's different from what we sign on the doctor's office. It's something much broader and much larger and much detailed. Uh, one thing that I have been suggesting companies uh, is a project that actually uh, relates informed con uh, uh, delivers of informed consent very similar to what Creative Commons license did in copyright through a series of symbols and, and, and things that facilitate the person signing that uh, uh, to actually give its informed consent so that we deal also with transaction costs and friction for companies offering services, right? So how can we do one type of informed consent that takes that risk uh, out of the companies but also secure uh, uh, um, and uh, make the consumers and the citizens understand what they're going to do with the data. There are a lot of restrictions in terms of data. All the companies uh, that operate in Brazil based on the Marco Civil, that's already in Marco Civil, that was approved in April, right, 24th of April, um, will have to, uh, to obey the data protection law and not just the companies that are physically in Brazil. So if you actually, uh, 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 even if you are in Japan or China, right, the, the Chinese searching engine actually is operating now in Brazil. They just opened uh, a new office in Brazil. So even if you do some marketing direct to Brazilians, you're going to have the jurisdiction does apply to you uh, related to that. So you're going to have to have informed consent and all those things. So I think that was the, the trajectory there, specifically regarding data protection. In terms of cables and things like that, how long do I have? Like two, one minute? OK. Uh, in terms of cables, Brazil is a country that's very dedicated to bilaterals with Africa. We have strong cultural relations with the Portuguese speaking uh, countries in Africa, so we are setting cables, we are setting another cable with Europe, and that's not to escape US, it's actually just to make our technology better and more efficient. 80% of our traffic pass through US now, 85% of our websites are hosted in the US. Um, CGI is developing 22 IXPs in Brazil, Again, this is just to make better our internet and connectivity in Brazil so countries in the rural areas do not depend just in satellites. Um, so I've, I've, I want to put this uh, sherry in, in, in the ice cream there because it's not just about like we are fighting against US. No, we want to provide better because that is in our broadband plan for more than five years. So I think that's a little bit the context in Brazil and, and I'm happy to, to give more details later. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, and I think Brazil is a great case study um, for something that we've noticed as we've been doing this research that if you look at the universe of proposals, some of these proposals uh, make more sense than others. And something that we're trying to do with the paper is to point out which of these proposals uh, are not a very good idea and which of these proposals uh, deserve more attention. And I think the debate in Brazil, especially about data localization, is a great example of uh, a proposal that was made in response uh, as a political response and most of the people who are engaged in this space and know the topic well said this doesn't make sense and it didn't go very far. Um, I just got back from Germany and to stay with the theme from Brazil to Berlin, it sounds kind of like your next vacation next year, um, to go over to Anska. Um, in Germany I'm not quite sure we are at that level yet in terms of the debate and the level of nuance where we have that debate about what proposals are more sensible than others. So it'd be great if you could give us a, a, an overview of the current debate in Germany, which of these proposals you see have gained more political traction, and your perspective from. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for uh, building these bridges between um, Europe, America, and connecting tech with politics. I think that's something that we lacked in the, in the last couple of months. And uh, I think we saw the, the negative outcome of it. So I think we underestimated a little the necessity to communicate on, on these issues uh, in the past months. Um, yeah, maybe give you a short overview of what happened in, in Germany over the last uh, months. Since the beginning of the Snowden affair, the uh, debate evolved quite considerably. Um, so this is really a, a 
try to give you an objective description of what happened. I think we see currently three different understandings of technological sovereignty in Germany. And I think it's important to distinguish them. There's one debate focusing basically as technological sovereignty as a right of the individual. It's about you as an individual should be in full control of your data. You should have full transparency what companies are actually doing with your data. So the, the main threat which is discussed in Germany obviously are big tech companies doing data analytics without consent from the individual or having, um, I don't remember the name of the company, but there's one which is <laughs> uh, currently discussed hardly in Germany, um, focusing really on the individual. That's number one. I think that's not really a new discourse. It has just been, um, got a new nuance from the, from the NSA debate. The second one is um, centers around the function of the state, which is about how to protect um, government infrastructures and critical infrastructures from be it cybercrime attacks or be it uh, foreign intelligence services. I would say that's the, the original NSA debate we had in Germany. We still have it. We have a committee um, uh, in, in, in the um, federal parliament inquiring um, the details. Um, it actually developed a little from focusing solely on what NSA did to what is actually our own intelligence services, uh, what our own intelligence services are currently doing. And um, it uh, becomes apparent that they don't uh, um, distinguish themselves so much from each other. Um, so we currently have a kind of a soul searching what uh, intelligence services should do, are allowed to do in relation to, to foreigners, to um, foreigners of nations which we regard as friends, and to our own population. Um, as you may know, classical intelligence services distinguish between uh, their own population and anyone else. So we don't have any friends in that term. There is no, no ally from the point of view of an intelligence service. It's either you're German or you're foreigner, be it French, American, uh, Pakistani, Afghani, that doesn't matter uh, in, in this system. And it has been, I think it's, it's now coming up as a, as a topic to um, the necessity to, to differentiate more in order not to have, a, uh, let's say, 100% um, opportunity to spy on, on uh, population of countries that we regard as friends. Um, and the third debate, which is probably the most important one and, and the one which would, uh, might become more important in the future, is basically about economic power. Um, the core argument here is that the digitization of value chains, which is taking place in any given industry we see currently, be it finance, banking, uh, production, uh, automotive, um, that this digitization will lead to a shift of power away from the companies which actually use this IT to digitize their value chains towards uh, big IT companies which provide digital platforms where all the data which is collected through sensors, etc., PP, is gathered, managed, and then distributed and uh, provided for someone who, who has an appliance, an app, um, uh, to make use of this data. Um, this debate basically translated into a discourse of asymmetric power between big US companies providing these data platforms and German companies who are in the receiving end using it but basically are in danger of losing their data, losing access to their customer, basically being the, the weaker partner in, in this relationship. Um, so you could argue what does it have to do with NSA? Um, probably not much but the, the the important thing is that both discourses are about asymmetry between a weaker partner in, in the current perception in Germany, it's, it's Germany, Germany as a state or German companies, towards a much stronger partner. On the other side, NSA, on the other side, as it perceived, the big IT companies, uh, um, US-based companies. And the difficult thing about this debate is, I think it mixes some, some interesting, very important questions with some very wrong and stupid answers. Um, the, I think the, the, the important part we should really uh, focus on is actually to understand better what this digitization of value chains is actually doing. It's a new phenomenon. Um, it's uh, not well understood. Uh, basically, these digital platforms are natural monopolies. Uh, and we're not really sure um, what kind of governance do we want to have. There's now a, a big debate in Germany, you may have heard, uh, the split up of Google. Um, it's a extraordinary debate because again it, it mixes uh, some, some important questions with, with rather stupid answers but um, how actually these di big digital platforms work is not well understood and we're still about to define what a government what kind of role government would play in this 
So uh, we now have heard that monopoly law shall be applied to a company like Google. Uh, I don't think it will work. But uh, you can see that they're trying to find a way to, to, to calibrate the answer of, of government uh, towards this new trend which takes place in, the ec in economics. Um, so there's an important question here. Um, obviously, the, 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 the wrong answer would be um, an attempt to build national infrastructures, national digital platforms. Um, it has been contemplated in Germany. So this is not fiction, but it's actually uh, a current debate. Um, from our point of view as a tech company, obviously, our customers are big, big um, uh, German companies from car manufacturing, uh, banking, finance, uh, retail, whatever. Um, they are completely have a different understanding of these platforms. They compete globally. They want highly efficient uh, digital platforms. So they don't think in, in, in nation state terms here. So to apply an, a framework which is basically based on, 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 on uh, the concept of the nation state, applying this framework uh, on these uh, um, digital platforms is, is highly dangerous and will probably lead to, to government sponsored initiatives um, uh, to build up an infrastructure which is then not competitive, will not be used by government, uh, by companies, and will end up as a uh, probably as a, uh, a bad venture uh, and of, of spending tax money on, on uh, projects which do not make sense. So, um, my estimate would be that the latter debate uh, will, will play a bigger role in the future. Uh, we'll see a debate about economic power in a digitized world. And unfortunately, we have a very emotional discourse on these topics right now. So it's, uh, I think the main task we have now is um, to, to connect, to build bridges, and try to, to sort out the important questions um, uh, and, and try to, to give uh, rational and answers which actually are in the interest of, of uh, the German economy. Okay. Emotional Germans, that sounds like a connection to Brazil. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Joe, we just heard uh, from two um, countries, um, one that's often uh, described as an uh, emerging power in, uh, and now Germany and Europe, um, that have intensely debated some of these proposals. You've written a lot and thought a lot about interdependence, and now you're also a member of the Global Commission on Internet Governance that tries to take a look at the global picture. And uh, from, from my perspective, it seems that both what's happening in Brazil and in Germany is actually part of a more global trend um, and there are things at play here um, that go beyond the two regions. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts, um, mm -hmm. how to connect the two and how we sh can think about that. Well, I, I agree uh, with both, both what Carlina and Oscar said. So let me just uh, not try to disagree, but simply put a broader context. Um, I wrote a paper for this Global Commission on Internet Governance, which was about international regimes for cyber. Now notice I used the word cyber, not internet. Governance of the internet 30 years ago was pretty simple. It was largely a coordination game in which it could be managed by technical people. The IETF would meet and not on national representational basis, but on technical criteria to decide uh, you know, what uh, were the appropriate standards and so forth. This really changes um, long before student. It starts to change really in the, um, I think I'd say at the end of the 1990s, when the web makes the internet uh, the basis for international and national supply chains, and it becomes the substratum for uh, essentially the economy. It, it, it's no longer a small community of scientists and academics and so forth. It suddenly becomes basic to economy. In fact, there's a paper that you wrote, Tim, that has a nice chart that shows a hockey stick effect taking off in, the, in terms of use of the, of the internet and the web in the 90s. Once this occurs, uh, there are enormous economic benefits. There are also enormous vulnerabilities. Once there are vulnerabilities, you introduce security issues. And security is an area in which governments traditionally have always had to play a, game, uh, a major role. It's an externality, which isn't handled by, by markets alone. And so essentially what you see is the sovereign state beginning to intrude into what previously had been largely a technical coordination game. And that is, is it, 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 you see, a, if you look at attention to, to these issues, there is a spike of attention early on in the, in, uh, uh, when ICANN is first 
founded and the, the Commerce Department has given control. There's a certain, if you look at press accounts, there's a certain spike of attention. That actually tapers off. Believe it or not, even during the period of, of WISIS, uh, 2003, 2005, uh, there's not a lot of attention. It's like, a little bit like Carolina said, who top political leaders had other things on their agenda. But it starts to become more important, even before Snowden, globally, as states realize that there are a lot of other issues. For example, we talk about fragmentation of the internet. Well, China's great firewall, which fragments the internet. After all, China is a pretty big fragment. It's about half the internet, or getting to be half the internet. But that goes to the question of political control in China. The Chinese want the economic benefits. They don't want to lose control by the Chinese Communist Party. And you see a, essentially a segmentation. So a Chinese citizen experiences the internet in a different way than a Brazilian or a German citizen deals with it. And uh, what I'm arguing is that this current dispute about localization, which follows Snowden, is merely a continuation of a trend that was ongoing anyway, of sovereign states being drawn in uh, because of the security and vulnerability issues. And I think we're going to see more of this, not less of it. Um, I, I, there's a very nice paper by uh, uh, Jonah Hill, uh, 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 which is in the July issue of, of, of Lawfare, in which he says, localization is political gold. It's, it's it, you know, this is just, uh, it's a way to combine protectionism and authoritarianism and put it in a grand package of anti-American populism. And it's very hard to turn that down. The fact that it doesn't help much, in other words, if you really want to have privacy and communication, it doesn't matter whether the email goes uh, from Sao Paulo to Brasilia via Miami or goes directly. There's a difference between the issue uh, of you know, who, uh, where the data resides and how you get access to the data. And you know, the, the, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese can all break into the, uh, to your email uh, unless it's encrypted properly. And it doesn't matter whether it goes inside Brazil or whether it goes across through, through Costa Rica. And, but in populist politics, uh, to say that uh, I want my German email to be strictly inside Germany, it's got to be on a server inside Germany, the fact that that doesn't stop the Russians from reading it, or the Americans, or the Chinese, or the Germans, uh, doesn't register in the populist mind. The populist mind says, we want this protection, it's ours. And then big business interests have a strong protectionist interest in, in reinforcing that. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm Deutsche Telekom, of course I like that, uh, uh, and I'll feed that. So th th I think one of the interesting questions is, if the trend is toward the increasing role of sovereign states, and if you find that for a variety of, of other reasons, uh, other motives, uh, there are forces that are pushing this, both populist forces but also commercial forces, how do you try to get uh, as much protection of an open internet as possible, A, and B, as much protection of private communication as possible. And the answer to that, I think, is going to put much more emphasis on in systems of encryption than it is on localization. But localization is so attractive uh, for a populist politician, it's so much easier, right? It's, it's cheap, it's easy, it, it fits your other agendas and so forth. So I think for people who care about um, uh, an open internet, the original vision, We've got to be realistic. It's not an open internet now. There are large chunks of it that are segmented. The, so the internet in Iran or Saudi Arabia or China is already a different internet. But if the internet is, a, is sort of a meta net, it's a, it's a connection of many internets, we have to reconcile ourselves that there will be different internet experiences in different parts of the world. We have to protect against anything that disrupts the central functions which essentially allow the meta net to connect nets. And for those of us who care about privacy, democracy, uh, uh, and security, we have to figure out ways not to let populist appeals 
uh, destroy or corrupt the experience of the internet in societies which remain open. I mean, we're not going to change China, uh, but uh, Brazil is a, is, a, is a great democratic success story. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to your elections, uh, but the but just in following it, the press, I mean, anybody who says Brazil isn't a democracy, is <laughs> you know, this is this is really a very interesting election. And uh, Marco Seville strikes me as a great example of a, of a of the right kind of process. Net Mundial was a was a very successful international conference, well managed, I think, by the Brazilian government. So it'd be a pity if if uh, if, the, if the quality of the internet for Brazilian citizens was reduced uh, because of a mistaken analysis of how you increase protection. Uh, and so I, I, would, I, I say this merely to put the, the issue that, that's, uh, that's currently on the table because of Snowden into a larger long-term context and, and sort of, as you asked me to think of it, how it fits in a larger perspective of, of uh, sovereignty and the traditions of what sovereignty means in international relations. And uh, Carolina, before I'll ask you to talk a little bit about the global internet governance uh, debate right now, Ansgar, I'd be interested, uh, because you mentioned the three different ways to think about the debate in Germany. <laughs> and if we take that uh, and combine it with what Joe just mentioned in terms of the trend of the sovereign state becoming more involved, what, from your perspective, is necessary for the debate in Germany to be able to reach that next level in terms of so sophistication, the nuance between what you described in terms of the three debates? And more specifically, I was uh, actually struck by the Financial Times that wrote, it published three articles this week related to this topic. And uh, one quote uh, from one of the articles that was titled, Europe Strikes Back. Uh, I, I don't think the authors get to choose titles uh, in this case either, uh, was uh, the political pressure in Europe for greater controls on the internet economy is mounting, particularly when it comes to the data handling regulations that set the basic rules of the road. So if we assume that the political pressure hasn't, hasn't subsided as in Brazil and is going, going to continue to mount, how are we going to juggle those three different debates and what do you think is necessary to make it a little bit more uh, productive in terms of the debate we've seen? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe first of all, I, th I think the, 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 the key issue of in, in a German debate is not the control of the nation state in, in terms of this land grab you, you, you so well described uh, of, of exercising state control on this infrastructure. I think this debate in Germany will be is very limited due to a very strong tradition of, of uh, liberalism, uh, um, civil rights in Germany. Um, you know, the, still the, there's a lot of mistrust against state power and uh, governments actually have an access to data in Germany. So I think there are clear limits to that debate. What I'm more concerned about is that, um, uh, first of all, uh, talking about the first level about individual rights, uh, we currently have a big split actually between what consumer actually do and what uh, so-called defenders of consumer rights uh, preach politically. So every consumer, uh, uh, every data protection officer in Germany is claiming that uh, um, uh, Google is evil. On the other side, we have a 90% uh, 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 user rate of Google in, in Germany. So it's interesting that the country which has probably the highest uh, uh, user rate in Google is also the one where it's politically so uh, so um, uh, 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 difficult for uh, um, uh, to to um, defend. So um, I think that's that limits also the 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 uh, basically the, the the grab the access of the of the government to this debate um, with the. Uh, on the economic level, I think the stronger, strongest defender of the open internet will be German companies. Um, German companies are very able globalizers. I mean, otherwise, we, we wouldn't have this economic growth over the last years, right? So they, they know pretty, pretty well what they're doing, uh, how to compete. And they compete by employing digital technology and actually by using a, an open uh, digital infrastructure, which is called the internet. Um, and these companies don't think in these national categories. They think about their value chain and they think about their, the partners they work with. Uh, to give you one example, if, if now there's a great debate in Germany about um, the connected car um, and many raise the questions, is it good news that now German uh, car manufacturers are cooperating with big American IT companies? Uh, who will be the loser of this, uh, who will be the stronger partner of this uh, partnership? Um, if you talk to the, uh, to the, the car companies themselves or companies like Bosch, um, they have a completely different perception to say, well, 
we don't think that Google can, can, can provide, the whole, uh, provide the whole technology stack. We're actually working closely with them in order to enable them to, to, um, to make this happen. So it's a very different point of view. It's about partnerships, value chains, organizing them along uh, most efficient ways where the internet is absolutely crucial for. So I think um, we have now a, a long way to go, I think, to, to uh, sort out our proposals made on technological sovereignty. Um, the, the more obviously faulted ones are already no longer really uh, on the agenda, on the political agenda. Others are still there and we need to, to really to, to sort it out. It will take some time, but uh, my impression is um, German companies will, will be more engaged in the future and they will make, probably will make, raise pressure if, if they feel that um, there is a kind of national protectionism uh, basically preventing them from, from uh, globalizing from Germany on. And um, another interesting part would be probably the, st the famous startup debate in Germany. We have a lot of uh, political attention to startups, uh, the growth hub of Berlin, and we want to have the next Silicon Valley. Um, I think they will realize at some point that it doesn't fit together. You cannot have uh, a, a nation-centric protectionism in the digital age and on the other side um, uh, um, uh, try to promote uh, startups. Startups in Germany need to internationalize very early on because their home market is considerably smaller than in the US. So you need to globalize, go abroad very early on. And in this early stage, every, um, every requirement of data uh, localization of, uh, uh, adds to the costs of internationalization. So um, if we really mean business with startup, uh, we, need an open, we need an open infrastructure, an open, open ecosystem. And I think uh, this will be um, one of the, there will be a development in that direction that we see. Um, we are not on the, we're not the victims of globalization, of digitization in Germany. Actually, we're, we're profiting it f from it over the last decade, and this will become clearer in the next uh, months. I hope so, please. Not you'll have to come back in a year and we'll have another conversation like this. We'll but, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, Curly, so Ansgar just pointed out how he, um, in Germany the German companies will be kind of the pushing the pre pressure. In Brazil, you mentioned it was a lot of civil society pressure that uh, was involved. If we take the internet governance debate right now, we had the IGF, the ITU planning part is coming up, and what Joe just described in terms of states trying to be more assertive in, in in their, in their role in internet governance. Where do you see this, where we currently stand, and uh, with the ITU plenty pot coming up in October? So I think, uh, I just wanna make one comment regarding our comments, and then I can jump on that. So um, I don't remember the correct expression, but one of our big authors always said that the companies are, I think, the third state, or something like that. <laughs> so companies do exercise a lot of power, right? And I think we have to separate the awareness of consumers and informed consumers and our day-by-day -day use of the internet. I use Google, I use Facebook, I use Twitter. My whole family's in Brazil, I wanna put pictures of my beautiful three-year-old <laughs> online for them to follow. But the point is, uh, I think we have obligation and a social responsibility, if you wanna put under that category for companies, to actually educate, uh, but also to really bring the consumers and civil society has informed uh, uh, stakeholder in this debate. And I think it's really important to understand, of course, like who here reads the 15, 20 page contract or every click through you do? Nobody, not even me, not, not the, I'm not a lawyer. Do you know, I cannot lose an hour reading every click through contract I sign every day, like every app you download that has, can I access everything in your phone? And this is Android, it's not even iPhone anymore. So uh, I think we need to be very careful here to not mix phenomena of your consumer office saying Google is evil and everybody using it. It's, th it's very different. In Brazil, we have very strong consumer, uh, public interest organizations, public knowledge, actually started has a very strong consumer organization and has expanded to other issues, uh, but always from a consumer point of view. Um, so I think the companies also have obligation even more with these laws coming out now and being passed up, these bills passing into law, to actually uh, 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 explain to the consumer what is being done with their data and then giving the consumer the choice and then of course the consumer will balance what they wanna give up. 
right? They want less privacy and more services, or they want to unplug from society and have absolutely privacy, which I personally think it's impossible nowadays. But anyway, but that's like an informed, responsible consumer. And even with students, right? We are developing an online course now exactly to kind of uh, form the next uh, generation of leaders. I think it's obligation for all of us here to really think about that, even if you teach in high school or if you, if you have interns, you know, like how to have that responsibility in the back of your mind every time. Anyway, so this is, is something that, because I was very uh, a little shocked with your comment on there. Uh, in Brazil, Brazil is a huge country. We have almost the same square footage than US. We have almost the same population. We are developing parts of the country are actually has reached, has developed countries. And Brazil realized that we do need to play a more central role in internet governance. Uh, the fact that I can came from US, you had the NTIA uh, 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 oversight position there. Even if uh, uh, NTIA didn't have a day-to-day -day decision making power within the ICANN uh, uh, role, it looks like uh, American hegemony, right? A lot of uh, international uh, uh, po uh, politics is very what what's look what looks like, right? Uh, uh, and how that reflects on high hegemony of a certain power state within uh, international. It's very funny that when I arrived in U.S. like seven years ago, I said Brazilians see U.S. has a hegemony state, and a lot of folks here have not even heard hegemonic. <laughs> so that was very it's funny for me how U.S. see itself and how other countries see itself. And Brazil is a democratic country and Brazil has much better dialogue with countries like even Iran, right? And sometimes U.S. could think, okay, can we partner with Brazil to talk with more di these difficult countries which we cannot do directly? So that's one of the things that will come up at ITU. ITU, Iran has, is doing like very strong propositions regarding the expansion of the ITU. Has it happening? the wicked, uh, uh, CITEL, which was the American or, uh, uh, organization uh, for the meeting of the Americans preparing to ITU just happened, the Asia meeting just happened, the Africa meeting just happened. So you have a bunch of new resolutions coming up now. Uh, I would really encourage you guys to get involved from public societies just PK within the US delegation. So I have a, a lot of restrictions what I can say. But the, the fights that we fought in Wicked will be fought again in, in the ITU Plenty Pot in late, uh, from 20th of October to 7th of November. So I would wish more people would be there. And Brazil is playing a very important role on trying to become a leader on internet, uh, international uh, uh, politics uh, on internet governance. So Brazil hosted the Net Mundial has a way to really strengthen the fact that I'm here, I should be heard, and uh, the, 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 the confidential uh, MOUs between the Five Eyes, which are the Anglo-Saxon countries that do surveillance, should be publicized, maybe through the ITU or somebody else. That's not what we agree with, but what's maybe coming up soon, right? Brazil is uh, pushing forward UN resolution on human rights and privacy. Uh, we are also pushing forward the same thing through the uh, a reno renew of the mandate of the IGF and so on. Uh, why? Because I think at the end of the day, since privacy is not a taken on the technology side, we need to rebuild a new international social contract on what is allowed and what is too much, right? Because what happened, even knowing that this comes from the late 90s with the commercial internet, uh, it's very important that at some point there should be an ethical or a social limit to, to what countries can do no matter what, right? So I think that's a little bit what we stand, and, and I really hope folks do pay attention to the ITU because we're going to have big challenges coming out of Iran and, and, and some of the BRICs, including uh, Russia. I don't see the BRICs aligned for ITU, but, but you have the pressure from Russia and India, who actually did not legitimate the results coming out of Net Mundial. So the big powers are there, and they're going to play in October and November. Before we uh, open up for Q&A, Joe, did you, um, is there other lessons learned from the regime theory and the article on uh, complex <coughs> regime theory that you just wrote f that might be useful to, for us to think about the looming internet uh, governance discussions? I, what, what I try to express in this uh, article on regime theory is to say that what we're seeing in the cyber world uh, 
is not u totally unique. I mean, we've seen it in other areas. So look at what's happened in international trade. You go from a situation in, uh, uh, after World War II when the Americans are dominant in international trade. Uh, in 2012, China became the largest trading oh, nation even ahead of Germany. Uh, but the trade system hasn't broken down. Yes, we haven't had a new Doha round, but the dispute settlement mechanism, uh, the Americans obey findings against them, the Chinese obey findings against them. In other words, despite the fact that the American hegemony in trade has declined as the American hegemony in the internet is uh, diminishing as, as the net spreads, and that will be increasingly true since the next you know, several billion people to, to, to go on the internet are going to be in the non-Western world, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't develop a regime or sustain a regime. So if we look at other areas uh, like trade, you'll see that uh, even when the American hegemony in that issue area has diminished, uh, there's enough interest in other countries to preserve a set of rules because it's in their self-interest to have, have these rules. So I think we can aim for thinking of that in, uh, in some aspects of cyber governance. It'll be easier in domain name systems and root servers and so forth than in areas like espionage, where, there's, where it's much harder to get governments to, to have a, an overall agreement. And so the paper basically distinguishes a number of sub-issues within cyber, some of which have a reasonable chance to have a uh, a set of international norms. Uh, I mentioned the domain name system, but also I would argue criminality, which we haven't talked about. But you know, the the, the extent of uh, criminality is extraordinary. This free riding on the system, and that hurts everybody, it hurts uh, uh, China and Russia as well as others. On the other hand, if you get an issue like free speech, China and Russia have a very different view than Brazil or India. Uh, so I think we're going to see different progress in different parts of creating a regime for the internet. There's not going to be one overall regime. You're going to see different sub areas where you can actually get norms with agreement. And we ought to then take those areas which have the better prospects, build on them, see whether we can get a set of norms, and then gradually hope that that will spread uh, to other areas. Anyway, that's the gist of of what I wrote for the commission, uh, whether the commission will accept this or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, international cooperation uh, is possible is a great theme for a transatlantic dialogue uh, mm -hmm. event. Yeah. So um, with that, let's open up uh, for Q&A. Please uh, make sure to state your name, your affiliation, and make sure that it's a question. We have mics coming. Um, and please also uh, point who you'd like to answer the question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tim Rideout from the German Marshall Fund. I'm a fellow there. And I do have one brief, brief comment before the question. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Barry Buzon, who termed the, coined the term uh, interaction capacity, sort of the structural logic. And I come from more international relations theory background. So basically, with people's ability to interact, trade, conflict with each other, the logic of the system changes is the theory. So with the internet and the proliferation, it seems that we're still operating on a nation state system but the structural logic has somehow changed. And I don't see how we square that unless we come up with new governance structures along the, you know, a new social contract that Carolina was talking about, new government structures, new regimes. And I wonder if the ITU and ICANN are equipped to handle it. And I wonder if you guys have any comments on that. Well, I personally don't want to. <laughs> I can and I too handle it even if they are capable of in terms of resources. Um, I really think that the effort that is being done here and, and Kevin Bankston from I OCHI is here uh, really f like through legislation reform, what are the limits we are willing uh, to uh, uh, accept in terms of what's done in name of security, right? So I. I was in Cambridge some time ago in, uh, in Massachusetts, and the taxi driving who was driving me around in MIT said, oh, here is where the police died after the bombing of, of that competition. And he said, yeah, it's good that everybody's looking at our emails to, to prevent that. That was not preventable, actually. But still, you have 
li different limits that people are willing to take, and that's when I say a social contract to understand these limits and different, and how different those limits are on society. What Kevin is pushing here is appropriate for the American situation. Is that appropriate for the Brazilian or the German or other situations? So that's what we're going to discuss. And then, is it appropriate to have an international agreement on this or not? We are not there yet, right? Um, and I would prefer that first we've set the ground on a human rights basis through the UN resolution on privacy and the study coming out of it, and then we implement through the technical bodies and, 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 and security bodies. That's how I would like to see this, but I don't know if that's how it's going to move forward. And one thing on, on trade I want to mention, um, I think US lost the hegemony on the WTO, that's true. For example, Brazil, we won um, a case against the US in the cotton case, but has until now we have not enforced the case. Uh, and that's why you see the proliferation of bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. Uh, now, I don't know if you guys follow the area, but we have the TPP, the Pacific Trade Agreement, the CETA, which is Canada and Europe, and uh, the TTIP, which is Europe and US. And all of them have internet issues on the e-commerce, IP, and service chapters. So what I'm trying to open the eyes of folks that follow internet government is that the binding rules are coming from trade. And if we don't pay attention to that, we keep discussing it here, but the rules are coming from that, including privacy, because all these um, agreements have free flow of information in the e-commerce. So if when you see free flow of information directives in e-commerce and not in a general chapter or uh, yeah, general chapter, because there is no human rights chapter on that. That's not freedom of expression. That's actually free flow for business, which means dealing with data. And there is no privacy there. I think in the chorus, which is US, South Korea, there is some privacy. And in, this, in the, the ones with Europe, Europe is trying to push for that. But it's still, so we need to pay attention to that too and see, OK, what is the social contract that are coming from binding laws from trade agreements? I, I agree with uh, what Carolina said. Um, in this uh, little paper that I mentioned, I draw an oval of things that govern uh, cyber. And the interesting thing, some things are strictly inside the oval or sort of within cyberspace, uh, in things that regulate domain name system or root service and so forth. But a lot of things that regulate uh, or set rules and regimes for cyberspace are really on the edge of the oval. They're half in and half out. So the WTO uh, is not a cyber organization, but obviously trade agreements have a huge effect on cyber. And they don't only affect uh, what we think of as, as trade issues, but uh, issues of privacy and what does it mean, probably going to be negotiated with the US and the Europeans in uh, TTIP, uh, and, and that, r that rather than as a special cyber meeting as such. And so I think, I think she's absolutely right that when, and there, there are many other areas of cyber which the governing areas are on the, the border, so to speak, of what's inside this oval and outside. Take, uh, we haven't talked about uh, military security, but if you take uh, the laws of armed conflict, uh, those really, and or the whole UN Charter, those are not cyber issues uh, per se, but they govern cyber. And the, the GGE, ex the, at the, uh, at the, the Chinese have now accepted that the laws of armed conflict do govern cyber. So there are lots of areas where, where the governance of cyber is influenced, not by some special contract that says cyber in the headline, but is governed by things that are on the, what I call the periphery of this little oval. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think we, if you look at it long term, you could argue that the, the old model of internet governance was developed in an era where nation states were probably completely underestimating what's going on there. So we had like strange animals developed like ICANN where political scientists were struggling with to understand what's actually happening there. I can remember when I was studying like all these scientists writing papers about ICANN, what, what, what is it? What kind of animal is it? It doesn't fit in our, in our models. And you could argue that now we see a trend that nation states take the internet definitely very seriously for economic reasons, uh, homeland security reasons, whatever, that they apply their logic, their very traditional logic of a nation state to the internet. 
And as the internet influences almost everything, it's, it's very natural that it's probably the end of this exceptionalism, this internet governance exceptionalism that we had for basically 25 years. So the, the question now is I have for you, Joe, is uh, are we entering the age of digital realism, which means very classical concepts of nation state power are applied to something which has been basically born in an, uh, let's say, in a shadow of, uh, um, of 25 years of uh, uh, underestimation of, from government side. Well, I, I hope that it's not pure um, state control. I, I think the, the idea of multi-stakeholderism is not that governments are excluded, but that governments are n not alone making norms, but s civil society and private sector are also involved. And th whereas if you compare that with the views that are propounded, let's say, by, by China or Russia, uh, they uh, want something where governments are much more in control because that's the way they run their societies with, with the government control. And if it, so if you're interested in, in free speech or human rights and so forth, having, a, 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 having an internet contract which says uh, uh, governments are in charge of security, uh, well, China and Russia, if you look at their resolutions at the UN, define security as to include speech, which they see as threatening to the regime. So if somebody in, uh, who's in Germany sends an email to somebody in Shanghai that says, um, uh, I think Xi Jinping is uh, uh, cracking down too hard, that email could be rejected uh, because it's a threat to the stability of, of the regime. Well, I don't think, you know, if you, I don't think we want a system where governments have that degree of control. So I, I think the, the idea of, uh, I mean, multi-stakeholderism is a, is a terrible term. It doesn't exactly trip off the tongue as a good bumper sticker, or, but, it, but it does illustrate that pure sovereignty, just to have uh, what Chris Demchek in an article called the Westphalianization of the Internet, uh, is, is not good for people who are interested in uh, an independent role for civil society and freedom of speech. Joe? Uh, hi, my name is Joe. I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Thanks for this discussion. Um, I'm a technologist, and the debate here has often been characterized by passive surveillance. Um, but we, the U.S. and its partners are doing different things than that even. So there's something we filed today, a, uh, a filing with the UN, or a couple days ago with the Human Rights Commission, that among other things, talks about something called quantum, which is an automated attack infrastructure, which doesn't merely do passive surveillance, but actually can respond in real time to things it sees, triggered, and install malicious software on the end user device. Um, I don't see, part of the problem with this is that uh, the journalists who revealed this stuff, it was amongst a din of stories about this, and I don't know if they did a very good job explaining the significance of this stuff. And I'm wondering, if, if what, do you see there being a distinction between passive surveillance and active attacks in this debate, or are they merely a different flavor of the same thing uh, to, to the, the governments that care about these things and the people that might make these very powerful political um, uh, uh, arguments about you know nationalism and, and sovereignty. Well, I don't know what's worst actually, right? Let me try a little bit uh, to answer your question. So you are talking about malwares and attacks and things like that, right? So I think those are a little harder for civil society and actually society in general to understand. Uh, but they, I, th I think they are more known because of the years and years. For example, Brazil has an amazing bank sy system. Actually, when I arrived here, I was like cultural shock because the Brazilian bank system was so much better <laughs> than the American banking system. But exactly because of that, Brazilians are extremely conscious of all the what you call active attacks um, because of so much training that the banks have given to their customers. Um, but that doesn't, but I think when a state uses that, should we be thinking about, okay, what is allowable and what's not, and what represents war and what's not, and when it represents even like some type of civil war, so how this is gonna characterize moving forward, and again, what is 
ethical and legal and what's not. I would love to hear from you what actually you think about that, you know, but. I think one of the things, I would, uh, um, I think the piece of the automation, I think, is yeah. uh, uh, one of the key pieces in what makes this uh, potentially different from others. Um, but I think that's part of a much larger debate where automation is, uh, covers a wide, if we're talking about uh, how to uh, respond to cyber attacks generally, if we're talking about just uh, military systems generally. Um, and there seems to be something there about the automation piece and at what point the human needs to be looped in to make that uh, determination. Uh, but I, would, I don't think that's, that's limited to surveillance. That's a much broader debate, I think, that, that uh, goes on. I, uh, Fr Frank Torres with Microsoft. Isn't one of the challenges that we face, uh, a diff another aspect of this is that existing law or e existing law didn't contemplate some of what technology can do today. And, and part of the question is, how do we more or less update the laws to take that into account? For example, here in the United States, we've got the Electronic uh, Communications and Privacy Act. Uh, that was passed back in 1986, and Congress is in the midst of revising that to kind of keep up with the way technology works today. Uh, my own company, Microsoft, uh, filed a case recently uh, pushing back against a warrant that is seeking data that is kept in a data center abroad. Well, when EC ECPA was passed, who thought that we'd have data centers and who thought that they'd be, you know, located around the world as companies become more and more global? Um, just yesterday, uh, Senators Hatch, Coons, and Heller introduced some legislation also trying to address this issue of kind of the global scope of warrants and, and what this all means. So, yeah, I guess my question is twofold. How do we keep up with the challenges of technology um, so that the laws keep pace with what's happening in the real world in re real time. And the second part is, given the global nature of uh, the Internet and the way companies are operating and working today for all the right reasons to bring all the benefits to societies around the world, uh, wh what's the role for international dialogue and cooperation? It seems like that needs to play a very big and vital role here. Well, I, on law, uh, Law is always going to be playing catch up. I mean, if you look how long it takes to pass any law anywhere, and you look how volatile uh, the cyber world is uh, under Moore's law, a different kind of law, uh, they're never going to they're never going to fit. What that suggests is the more you can find ways to supplement law or avoid becoming too rigid in law, the better. One of the ways you can do this is developing in the security area is developing effective security markets. Uh, I, I mean, sorry, insurance uh, for, uh, so that if a company, if you pass a, a law that says you can't do X, um, then it's locked in place. If a company says, do I want to spend on this or that, uh, and it turns out their insurance broker says, if you spend on it, it may cost you more now, but your insurance rate is going to go down. That leaves flexibility. And so if, if we don't, I mean, you have to supplement law by market mechanisms and also by uh, general social norms um, because you're always going to be playing catch up. And on the international level, uh, you're absolutely right. What's interesting, though, is the extent to which there is beginning to be a dialogue. In other words, you not only have these large conferences, I mean, WISIS plus 10 is next year and so forth, and the uh, ITU penitentiary and so forth. But, but you have a lot of uh, informal uh, meetings and, and discussions which are developing uh, expectations and norms. Uh, some of these are large uh, conferences like Net Mundial. Uh, others are track two or track one and a half in which you have a dialogue uh, which is uh, with people who are close to government but not speaking officially for government. And this has had a, an effect of advancing the way people think about it. I, I remember at one of these meetings talking about, uh, which I think it was the British Conference on Internet and Society uh, a, a couple of years ago in London, and uh, talking with one of the Chinese delegates and about the issue of crime. And he said, well, you know, yes, it's true that you and we define crime differently, but what we can do is 
have an agreement on things that are doubly criminal. They're criminal in both our systems. So, uh, you know, sending an email that uh, seems destabilizing, it's a crime in China, but not the U.S. But stealing credit card data, that's a crime in both countries. So the, we can, but in these kinds of dialogues, we can start to identify the places where you could get agreements. And uh, I think you're, I think law is going to be crucial and agreements are going to be crucial, but we've got to be very careful uh, to keep the dialogue going and keep flexible the, the type of, of instruments we use. Maybe to, to add to this, I think, uh, I think we're in desperate need of policy innovation. Uh, the tools with which we try to, to, to shape these markets are often completely outdated. Uh, in Germany, we, sh we see a widening gap here. For example, um, German data protection laws almost exclusively aim at consent as a tool to, f to allow data processing. Uh, the consent tool is completely overestimated because in the end, what you mentioned, you click on every, on every consent button you can, uh, which appears on your screen, right? So it's not an effective tool. People do not really have a choice when, when the consent button uh, appears if it's too complex to it. So, um, and to add to this, I think uh, probably a change of the rules which uh, Mozilla Foundation uh, defines to its browser has probably a bigger impact on, on privacy in Germany than any, any change of law, right? So in that sense, code is law, yes. <laughs> and uh, I think it makes sense to, to reevaluate the, the, the role of, 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 of legal mechanisms of law in this sense. If you start to, to think from where you actually want to, to uh, what's your aim, and then start from there looking at the different tools you have at hand, maybe nudging as, a, as something which was uh, uh, explored, uh, especially by UK government, as a tool of, of influencing consumer behavior, uh, trying to influence what actually uh, associations, uh, companies do with their standard setups in, 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 their, in their products, might be a much more efficient way then to achieve your goal than, than adding another law, which uh, has probably only very limited uh, reach out to the, to the customer. So I think we need to be a little more flexible here, uh, taking law as one option, but there might be very different new, new uh, engagement uh, roles. Uh, which are m much more efficiently. So that's rather saying we have a problem here. I think there are, we need to be a little more innovative here than, uh, rather than, the, than widening the gap between the legal status in a country and what's actually, actually happening in the market and how consumers behave and how are they, they are interacting with technology. So we have time for one more question. Or uh, if we have two, we can combine them. So if you could, we'll take both questions at the same time and then we can Sorry, combine answers. Yeah. You want to go first? Oh, uh, my name is Tom Seitz. I'm with uh, Washington Analysis Group. I think this is um, probably more for Professor Nye, but I'd love to hear everybody's opinion. Um, and I apologize. This is about net neutrality, which I'm sure we could have a whole other debate on. But here in the States, they are uh, one path the government is considering going down is regulating the Internet under Title II, which is essentially utility type regulation and I understand that you know they could forbear a number of the provisions of that but what what kind of signal do you think that sends to the rest of the world that the government is going to be more in charge of the internet and disputes aren't going to be settled um, more in the in the private sector do you th it, does that send a bad signal in your view or do you think that that's just a um, way overblown by the, the, the folks that oppose a Title II type um, regime. So we have uh, two more questions here. That sounded already like an event in and of itself, the first question. So, uh, Thanks. I'm going to see if I, can, if I can link my question to that. Uh, Sri Ramaswamy with, uh, with McKinsey. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something, Ansgar, that you said. And you said digital platforms uh, are natural monopolies. Uh, and I wanted to kind of see if we could elaborate on that because, you know, many corporations do have private platforms. And even in the consumer space, yes, Google is sort of a monopoly, but, you know, Amazon, Etsy, um, eBay, and now you've got Alibaba coming out. Uh, so I wanted you to see if we could clarify that. And then broadly to the rest of the group, the implications of that. If you do have competition in private providers of digital platforms versus monopolies, how does that change the whole governance structure and what policy should do? Yeah, and we take, yeah. 
mine's enough different that you may want to focus on those. I, looking at technology and the tension between aggregation and disaggregation, countries, corporations, et cetera, um, it, and kind of getting back to the first question, the focus on how governments or countries are affecting the internet is one I would be interested in thoughts on how the internet is or technology is affecting sovereignty and where you see that debate, um, the kind of the new tensions about sovereignty and rulemaking taking place. Maybe starting with the, with the last question. Uh, I think the, the interesting phenomenon we see is that, I mean, in, in, in political science, we understood probably what globalization means to a nation state 20 years ago. That's a rather old debate. And we analyzed what, what does this restriction of sovereignty actually means if you're entangled in this web of uh, uh, of global uh, uh, interdependence. Um, but I think now we can feel the punch, and that's the difference. I mean, everyone experiencing now how, how limited actually the response of German government is to these uh, revelations of, of Snowden and the, the uh, uh, other questions in digital realm, it's, uh, it's a different feeling, uh, understanding things, but, but seeing actually the outcome on it. So I would say from the analytical side, the Snowden part um, spit up a lot of the things that we already knew. So it's not too much new, actually, to, to understand there. But it's just it's awkward to see it in, in practice. And look at the roles of parliaments in the, after the whole Snowden debate. I think that's really interesting. Um, what, what role played German parliament in the whole debate? It's a, it's a very limited one, which is a, it's a, it's a serious question uh, we see here. If um, parliaments are, are uh, core for our democracy, right? But, but what kind of effect did they have? They were in the end, they were dominated by executive powers, f first instance. And uh, I think also Snowden made it pretty clear what he, uh, what he re <laughs> thinks <laughs> how effective uh, parliamentary control is of uh, uh, intelligence services. Uh, not too much. Otherwise, he would have gone to a committee in, in Congress and not to uh, the Guardian, right? So it's, uh, I think there's some, some really important questions to, to, to address um, with the regard to how the digital world is, is restricting sovereignty. Um, with regard to the, to the data platforms, um, the problem is, I think, we, we haven't really understood how these markets really function. Um, in the end, uh, you could argue that um, um, platforms provided by single companies who have an, uh, a market reach of, of 80%, 90% are something like a monopoly, and they could be very beneficial. So from a, from a government point of view, it might be uh, acceptable uh, to have this monopoly in place uh, because everyone benefits. But at some point, there might be the um, might be a necessity to, to intervene. Um, we have very bad analogies for this situation. I mean, everyone now relates to, is Google the new standard oil? Or is company X comparable to the beginning of when the railways took off in, in the US, etc.? cetera? Um, so it's not well understood. Sascha Lobo, a German blogger, uh, used the term of um, uh, platform capitalism as, as a new phenomenon, where Basically, there is an intermediary between, between uh, the customer and the companies. It's, an, it's an, uh, a platform with a certain governance, which basically restricts, uh, restricts access, um, uh, defines the rules of engagement. And someone is doing that, right? So take the example of an app store. Um, it's great for companies to, to be able to scale their innovation and reach so many customers with simply tapping into an existing infrastructure like an app store. That's great, and it's a, it's a huge innovation. But on the other side, someone is making the rules how this platform works, right? And who has access and who's not. Uh, currently, we would probably say an, an app store for a mobile operating system is a great idea. But uh, it potentially, it could be, could be a problem because uh, we're not really, basically, a single company is, uh, is, is making decisions uh, which affect, in the end, a large part of an economy. So um, I would suggest uh, we need some more research on, on the, how these data infrastructures will will um, function in the future. We're now discussing, in, you know, coming from the German perspective, platforms for the connected car are immensely important for the future of the German economy, how they're actually going to be structured, who will define the rules for this, who will govern them. Um, and this is something where I think German politicians take a legitimate interest in to understand what's going on there, because it affects uh, quite a lot of uh, jobs in Germany, right? Um, and I think. Um, so there's a legitimate interest to, to, uh, uh, to, to um, be engaged in that debate from a political side. The problem is simply, I see it, uh, even we in, in industry have not really understood what's happening there and how it will play out in five to ten years' time. So it's difficult to, uh, to, to describe a clear role of government, what to do and what not to do. 
the, the, the danger is that we will have uh, probably our classical antitrust law does not fit. And it's dangerous to, to, uh, to employ it too early on. This is basically what's happened in Germany right now with the Google debate. The, the call for a split up of Google is, is nonsense. It doesn't work. Uh, antitrust work cannot be applied to that case other than maybe the, the ad market. But if you talk about the, 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 the big shadow of Google on the car, uh, connected car market, on home appliance market, um, there's not even revenue from these, from, from these fields. So you cannot apply antitrust law to it. So I think we're in the beginning of the debate and trying to understand uh, what's going on. And any input, really welcome. I, I checked for, did some desktop research on this. I, I really didn't find much. So if you guys have uh, <laughs> some thoughts on this, uh, it would be really interesting to, to feed this into the debate in Germany. As a think tank, we always like calls for more research, and that keeps us happy. Uh, <laughs> we're we are running out of time. <laughs> uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so, Joe, Carolina, if you had any final thoughts. And well, as uh, a representative from public knowledge, of course, I'm here, and I support Title II, and that's what we feel comments on. And I think that does not sign, send a bad signal. States have to regulate sometimes, they have to intervene, is within their power, is within their authority, and if they are supported by a consensus of stakeholders, that's what should they do. The, the, the comments were very supportive of Title II, and I think that's it. Um, and um, we don't want to pay prioritization. The same discussion is going to happen in ITU on the resolution of international internet connection. So we should pay attention to that, to what's coming out of that. And, and, and I think that's, that's very important. And I think uh, uh, FCC regulation is much more uh, uh, flexible over time than legislation. Coming back to your uh, the Microsoft uh, uh, representative question, um, uh, legislation takes forever. You learn that at first year of law school. They will never catch up. That's why uh, John Perry Barlow did that declaration of internet out, uh, states out of the internet in the 2000, I think early 2000s. Um, but I think uh, sometimes regulation is needed, and, and, and that's how, how social contracts are expressed. Um, I think um, that's it for now. I've, I had another comment, but I can come out with it later. Well, since we're out of time, I'll do very quick answers. I agree with Carolina on net neutrality. On competition, when you have something as volatile as, the, as cyber, I can't get too excited about this threat of monopoly. Remember 20 years ago, Microsoft was taking over the world. We had huge problems about how we were going to break up Microsoft, fines against Microsoft, and so forth. Yeah. Nobody's worried about Microsoft taking over the world today. What we should be asking is, instead of breaking up Google, who's going to re be replacing Google in five years? I mean, you know, it's, it, any technology as volatile as this, it just strikes me applying traditional monopoly law thinking is probably not very useful. And on the last question about uh, 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 how does uh, the internet affect sovereignty, but basically, uh, I like, uh, Oscar used a very nice phrase, we, in democracies at least, we have three sets of values. We have uh, liberty, security, and economic welfare or growth. And we want, it's, it makes a triangle, and it's not that you want to be caught in any one corner of this triangle. You're continually trying to balance a place in the middle. But the interesting question is, who does the balancing? Uh, it should be done, and in principle, by legislatures with the oversight of judiciaries. And we should have procedures for that. But what's interesting is what happens when an individual like Snowden decides he's going to determine the balance. And because of the capacities in the cyber world, he is able to suddenly do that by himself, one individual. And we're entering a world where we have democratic procedures which tell us how this should be done, but which empowered individuals, right or wrong, can suddenly overthrow procedures that democratic theory tells us is how to do it. I, we haven't figured that one out yet. On that note, yeah. thank you all for coming, especially thanks to the panelists, and please join me.